My name is uh, Rahul Bhargava. I am the founder and CTO at uh, Evolfin. We are based in Silicon Valley in San Ramon in the Golden State. Unfortunately, we were not so golden yesterday night against your Raptors. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, three topics. There is a lot to cover. The first one is on uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and how that's impacting the media production workflows. Evolfin is focused on uh, MAM Systems Media Asset Management. Uh, the other topic would be Avid Adobe Bridge. I know a lot of folks here have uh, Avid Interplay or Media Composer as well as uh, Adobe Workflows. So how are the two workflows interoperating? Um, we'll talk about that. And then finally, remote editing. A lot of teams are decentralized. You have folks working from home or other offices, and how do they collaborate when working with large media project with 4K, 8K files. So the first topic is uh, AI. Before I start, just by show of hands, how many here are looking at using AI technologies in their media workflows? So some hands, all right. Hopefully by the end of this, uh, you would be convinced to look at AI even more. So one of the reasons that we see customers look at AI is they might have a, a traditional MAM that's great at indexing, ingesting, organizing their media assets, but they might have millions of assets uh, in the archive that they are trying to monetize and get greater value out of that. And that's where these AI engines uh, and MAM integration come along. So there are two key aspects of that. One is searching. If you have lots of historical archived assets, that are not tagged, are not in a folder structure that's easy to find, how do you reuse them and, and monetize the value? The other aspect that's uh, getting traction is automating the editing workflows using AI technology. Now, as far as AI engines are concerned, there are quite a few. At Evolfin, we integrate with over 250 machine learning engines, and these can extract a lot of metadata from your images, videos, and audios. Uh, for example, OCR. So if you have a player with a jersey, with a jersey number, the OCR engines can extract that. Speech to text, you might have a lot of historical audio. Uh, you want to convert the speech into text, into closed captions. Uh, you might have uh, languages like Italian that you want to translate to English and have the system index those uh, uh, audio tracks so that you can find things. Object recognition, you might have the need to search for a child in a, a video or animals, etc. Object recognition is, is one of the most popular use of machine learning technologies to, to uh, search in the videos. Geolocation, you might be interested in looking at a specific landmark, finding the CN Tower in, in Toronto in tons of footage. That's where the geolocation uh, uh, parsing comes along. Scene description, uh, this is still in infancy in, in the AI world, being able to mark an entire scene as a clip and being able to then uh, find all the uh, scene transitions. Face recognition, this is uh, 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 quite good, being able to detect celebrities uh, as well as being able to train these engines to look for uh, people that are important to you, perhaps the CEO of your organization, you want to be able to search on that. So engines these days allow you to not only look for celebrities, but also be able to uh, uh, other uh, faces that you can train. Demographics, you might be producing uh, content that's targeted at a, a particular uh, country or ethnicity, and you want to be able to locate uh, faces that match uh, a certain ethnicity or, or demographics, you can do that. With uh, Evolfin, we have an uh, AI module that basically integrates with all these machine learning engines and brings the power of AI into the, the uh, media production workflow. So how do you start out with uh, AI? You might have tons of content sitting in the cloud or in tape or on NAS, and these archives could have millions of uh, files. So you typically need a MAM data migration process that can be driven through rules and metadata. So for example, before you start recognizing interesting elements in your video, you might need to submit some training samples like images of celebrities or, or, or shots of people that you want to recognize to the AI engine 
before uh, you can start with the video recognition. So this entire framework of working with uh, historical archive content and sending it to the AI engines by generating like proxies. You don't want to send high-res media over the cloud to the AI engines because that will be just too much traffic. The other option is to do this on demand. Once you get your assets in, in a, a media asset management system, you might set up metadata rules to say, if the asset is marked for recognition, then select all the batches of these asset and send it to a certain AI engine. Perhaps you want to send some files to a Google logo recognition engine or uh, AWS for uh, images. You can set up these rules and, and then have precise analysis done. So let's say I was looking for uh, logos in videos. So this is uh, looking at the AI data that was extracted from footage. So say I was interested in finding all the moments where Coca-Cola shows up in videos. So what's happening behind the screen is the system has already tagged videos uh, using the logo recognition from Google, and I'm able to go to the precise point in the video where Coca-Cola shows up. And if you look at the left-hand side, it shows you all the engines that we have applied to this uh, set of videos. There is a uh, speech-to-text transcription that was captured. Uh, there's object recognition from another engine, as well as uh, logo recognition from Google. And what the system is doing is taking all these metadata timelines that the AI engines return and helping you visualize that in, 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 in this uh, view. And this is great. if one of the, the reason that uh, uh, AI technologies often fail is people don't train or don't choose the AI engines wisely. So you can select three or four competing engines. So you might have a very tone driven AI engines or a gray meta as well as directly to Google or Amazon or IBM. And you can visualize the data that's written by these engines in this timeline and compare the results to see for your content which engine to, to pick. Now, once you pick an engine, uh, training is a key part of that. So for example, over here, uh, we were supposed to recognize uh, FIFA, and let's say that logo was not correct. So how do you inform the AI engines that uh, there are corrections? And that's where this sort of visualization helps, where you can go and edit any of the data in here and feed it back to the learning models of the AI engines. So from this uh, interface, if you wanted to um, perform edits. That's also uh, uh, something that you can do. And let me uh, show you that. Let's say I was looking for some NFL uh, clips in here. And um, once I find the, the NFL clip, I wanted to find all the moments where the touchdown uh, uh, was detected. And I can use the AI engines to automatically detect a touchdown scene. And so once I select this uh, scene filter, the, the detection is done by the AI engine. I can then choose number of options here. Like one of the options is to create a sequence and send it back to my uh, editors. So as a producer, I could have the AI engine tag quickly and within second, I could send this sequence into my edit room where somebody could use a NLE like Premiere to go and do an edit. So once a sequence is created, the experience for an editor could be as simple as, this is uh, Adobe Premiere. I could look for that sequence, which shows up as this XML file, and I could then go ahead and add that uh, sequence into my uh, uh, project. Once I add the sequence into the project, if I, so I have all the touchdowns pre-cut in this video. So without something like this, the producer would have to scrub through footage looking for the interesting moments, and or the editor would have to scrub through the, the videos and then find all the interesting moments where the touchdown occurred. And this workflow might have taken uh, hours versus now using the combination of AI to detect the scenes and the, the sequences being sent into the NLE, we could do this in, in seconds. So that's basically searching and, and editing with uh, AI technologies. So just the way we can work with a single video, you can even create uh, multi-footage sequences. So for instance, I could 
uh, search for Tiger Woods, find all the clips where Tiger Woods shows up at a particular in out points and automatically create a smart sequence and send that to the editor. Similarly with uh, images, you could uh, recognize uh, 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 players and be able to perform a search and do uh, uh, cropping based on the area of interest in, in the images. So this is a use case uh, uh, with one of our uh, customer, Inter Milan. It's one of the oldest uh, club in uh, uh, um, uh, Europe. This is me at uh, a game that happened last Sunday, Inter Milan versus Empoli. This was one of the key match, uh, the final match of the season that decided if they would make it to the European Championship. With Inter Milan, the, the key pain points were they had 110 years of uh, archive footage. So there were millions of videos and images that they were, they were having a hard time use, uh, to, to use in, 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 in production. The other big pain point for them was working with their sponsors. So if they were working with uh, like a, a BMW or any of those sponsors, the sponsors often want content that's personalized to them. So if there is a player running on the field and about to score a goal or scored a goal, and on the LED wall, uh, there's a logo of that company, they want Inter Milan to create a, a clip based on what shows up on the LED wall. And that's very difficult and challenging for the production team to do. We were told that the editors could spend six to seven hours scrubbing through uh, game footage, looking for all the interesting points where the logo shows up on the LED wall and, and, and a certain player basically is also running on, on the field. Uh, the the post-production team has often a, a, s a finite duration of time, like six or seven days before the embargo is lifted, and then other people can start filling the social media with interesting clips. So they want to speed up the process of creating interesting highlights and clips from the match footage. And Inter Milan is looking at taking advantage of uh, AI technologies and our MAM to uh, speed up uh, those, those workflows. One other interesting pain point that was related to me was um, when a match is going on and there's a foul, like there's a yellow card or a red card called out, in the field, the, the staff wants to get a replay of that, that portion quickly. So right now, they actually have someone in the studio with a phone looking at the monitor and the live stream, they basically capture using a phone and WhatsApp the clip to, to the, the dugout where the, the folks can then go and argue with the, the referee. So using this technology, we would basically be in real time tagging the live footage with the combination of AI and MAM. And if there's an interesting moment that they need to send back into the dugout, they can just create a sequence and it would be something that they can access from a mobile device without any uh, transcoding or, or taking time to create that uh, clip. So Inter Milan is looking at a, a major digital transformation using AI technologies and, and MAM. And uh, MAM is going to be at the heart of this digital transformation. It'll connect with their digital experience uh, platform. They have uh, a CMS that will personalize content based on who's coming in. So if you are a fan coming in from China, the website would um, basically sh start to show you images and footages and content that you might be interested in uh, from, from that angle. So the, the MAM will basically be the single point of uh, uh, truth to serve all the content to the, the DXP platform. It'll also integrate with uh, the uh, Salesforce marketing cloud to personalize content there. A sponsor might log into Salesforce requesting certain graphics or footage and a lot of that content would be automatically created based on the AI generated metadata with, with the MAM. All right, so the next topic is uh, Avid and uh, Adobe. So if you are an uh, Avid house, you probably have uh, Interplay and you might have ingested a lot of content in uh, Interplay. And if you want to bridge with the Adobe world, uh, you have a couple of options. You can do this manually or you can automate this workflow of transferring master clip and sequences from Avid into Adobe. We have uh, a connector with our partner uh, Stelly Stream uh, that allows us to 
monitor uh, a bin inside uh, Interplay uh, server and be able to pull media into the, the MAM and transcode that, index that, so that people who are working on the digital workflow using uh, Premier or, or non-Avid system can have access to the, the same content. So going back to the final topic, which is remote editing workflows. So if you have editors that are working from home or you have teams that are split across geographies, uh, one of the challenges if you set up a system, let's say, on the cloud, so how do you get your content or changes that you are making to a project quickly to the collaborators that are, are on a remote location? Now, with a traditional DAM or MAM system, the way that has worked is you produce, let's say, a, a version from After Effects or any of the editing app, let's say a QuickTime file that's 10 gigabyte. Every time you make an edit, you end up uploading uh, a 10 gigabyte file. So that could be 20 gigabytes for two versions. But with the next generation MAM like ours, uh, there is front-end deduplication technologies that are integrated in the desktop. And what that means is, as you make changes, the system only transmits the deltas over the network to uh, a server hosted on the cloud, cutting down on the amount of network bandwidth that is needed to transmit these changes, as well as the, the storage. So let's take a look at that in action. Uh, we'll take an example of a Photoshop file. I switch the colors of these poppies to orange, and inside the uh, Photoshop uh, app, I have a plugin that would allow me to sync my changes. So when I click on the sync button, the system brings up a metadata dialog that allows me to tag the, the uh, changes. But when I finish the check-in, if you look at the number here, it says two, around 2.2 megabytes. So that's the amount of data that was transmitted to the server. But if you look at the actual file, it's much larger than two megabytes. It's over 100 megabytes. So what's happening behind the screen is the system on your desktop is detecting the, the deltas or changes and transmitting that, and that cuts down on the time tremendously. So if you are a creative collaborating with uh, an editor in a remote location, that might mean you're just exchanging a couple of uh, megabytes versus uh, gigabytes of content. So this technology works with uh, uh, all media types. If you have uh, videos that you are rendering in After Effects or exporting in uh, Premiere, uh, it could track the changes across the videos that you are making. So in this example, the version three was saved with just 20 kilobyte because perhaps I added a title card and rest of the video was, was the same. So it was just 0.01% of the, the previous uh, version. This can cut down the amount of storage that you need on the cloud or on premise. Uh, a lot of our customers have reported cutting down the storage growth by 50 to 60% by using this front end deduplication technology. The other aspect of uh, working remotely is you might have ingest happening from multiple locations. So this is uh, one of our customer based in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, they have an agency in New York that they work with. And the challenge is um, the high-risk content is coming in from uh, four different sites. Uh, they were having a hard time tracking where the high-risk content was. A final export could be done at any location. So if they were doing a final export in Munich, they needed the high-risk content in, in Munich, but for editors to go send a request to someone in uh, Dusseldorf or Frankfurt to say, hey, transmit this over Aspera, that was a very slow workflow. So using a MAM like ours, they can perform remote ingest, and it tracks the source location. So it knows which SAN at which site has the high-risk media. And what that allows it to do is the content can be transported locally, so if it detects that the content originated in, in San Ramon, it would use a local transcoder in San Ramon to create the proxy and ship the proxy to the head office in uh, Munich. And um, if an uh, editor wants to request the high-res content from a remote location, they just have to say right-click, sync the file, and the system knows where the high-res media is sitting. If it's sitting in uh, New York, it would trigger a file transfer automatically through uh, a accelerated WAN transfer like Aspera or File Catalyst and move the content and inform the editor that the content is uh, online. And similarly with archiving, let's say the content was archived in S3 or Glacier and an uh, editor in uh, Frankfurt requested the content. 
So based on the location of the editor, the system knows that the high-res media needs to be transferred from the S3 glacier into a SAN in, in Frankfurt. So that process uh, is, is completely automated. The other option for uh, large enterprises that are distributed is a solution like our Zoom nonstop. And this allows you to create active, app, active replicas of your MAM databases on multiple sites. So this is uh, a scenario from one of our biggest customer, uh, Mercedes-Benz. They have three locations uh, in, in Silicon Valley, in China, and in uh, uh, Germany. And the MAM databases are replicated at all these locations in real time. So editors that are working in China with uh, the firewall uh, slowing them down can work with local content from the MAM database. And if they make an edit to a Premiere project or to a Maya uh, 3D animation project, those changes are synced to all the other database in real time. And so this ensures that if I am in Germany and access the same Maya file or uh, a Premiere project, I'm doing it from my local uh, MAM server, speeding up the, the uh, workflow. Finally, the asset organization, that makes a huge difference to uh, managing remote editing workflows. So MAM solutions like ours allow you to have a hybrid strategy with your assets. So certain assets can be, based on rules, marked as direct ingested asset. What that simply means is these assets go directly into the MAM database that could be hosted in the cloud or on-prem. And certain assets like your high-res media footages, those could be marked as external assets and they can live on the SAN with a low-res proxy automatically generated and stored in the MAM database. So this allows collaboration where somebody could be editing with a low-res proxy, but the final confirm can happen in the head office and they can just, with a click of a button, switch from all the low-res proxies that they are linking with to, to the high-res uh, uh, version. A key uh, set of features around link management are essential for these remote workflows. So in our system, an asset can have uh, many associations we can have elements, graphic elements, image sequences, and footages that are linked. Any exports that are done from an asset like a Premiere or a Media Composer project are tracked, so you can always locate an exported file back to the original uh, projects. If this is a, a design project that uses layers, those are tracked in the MAM. If you clone a project, those are tracked as smart links and uh, smart copies. And the reason this is important is when you are working when in, in remote sites, it's very hard for editors to find out what changed. If you change the logo, that needs that will impact a bunch of uh, uh, the projects that you are editing with. How do you quickly find that out? By maintaining all these associations in the MAM, it makes it very easy for remote editors to, to just uh, figure that out. <laughs> 